Sugars, welcome back to the Business Coach TV show and podcast. Here today, I got Carrie Kaufman from San Diego. Hey, Carrie. Hey, Brad. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. You know, I find wonderful coaches all over the world. And the first question I always ask them is, why become a coach? Uh, what I love about coaching is it's, it's fun. I get to work with a variety of businesses, and it's a way to multiply my impact because I'm not just helping one person. When I help a single business owner, I help their whole team. They create more jobs. They serve their customers better. And I love the ripple effect um, and that impact that you get. And you really just, you build some great personal relationships along so the way. So all the years you've been doing this, you talk about great personal relationship. There must be some fun clients, some favorite clients oh, over yeah. the years. Yes. Tell me, give me, give me one of them. And what's the biggest lesson? Because this is the thing, everyone watching, you got to get the lessons out of each of these stories. I think one of the common denominators that I've seen is when a business owner really transforms their mindset from being a person in business or a business owner, an entrepreneur, whatever other labels they might give it, to thinking like a CEO. Even right. if they still have a small business, it's just, it's a mindset shift. So name one that did that. Who's who's the client? What did they do? Don would be one of them. Don? You've met Don before. She's uh, won some awards and been around for a long time. What's and her business? What style of business is she in? Don runs a catering company. Right. Because she's a chef. So when she's... <laughs> First mistake in business, going into business, doing something you know how to do. Right. So she was a great chef. And so the business grew to some extent because they're good at what they do. Yeah. And made good it. food. Therefore, people yep. kept coming back, etc. Exactly. So that's a typical process. So how did you client. shift her from being a chef to being the owner of a business or to being the CEO of the, the chef business? Well, the first thing she needed to get to understand was the, the numbers of the business. Right. Uh, and that type of business in particular, even as much as the cost of produce changing, uh, meat prices fluctuate, uh, the team overserves or underserves, it can really, it's a difference in being profitable and not being profitable. Right. So we had to dig in and look at profit margins and numbers. And, and as you can imagine, being a creative, artistic, culinary world, was not her forte. You know, it, it's interesting though that people go in and they run their own business and they say, yeah, I'm still no good with numbers. What are you doing no good with numbers? You run your own business. If you're running your own business, get good with numbers. Yes. So that was first phase. Was there a psychological or a mental or emotional phase she had to go through? Absolutely. The first time I made her, we laid out all her, her financial statements on the, on the desk and she literally cried. Like she, just <laughs> complete overwhelm. Just brain, my brain doesn't work this way, Carrie. I can't process it. So then we had to back it up. Uh, thankfully, she had a great bookkeeper. So we were able to break it down into smaller chunks. Um, and now she's savvy. She's so hang on, does she still cook these days? Is no. she in the kitchen? No. What happened the first day she was not allowed in the kitchen? She thought she would hate it. Right. It turned out she loved it. Oh, really? Yeah, she did. She said, she goes, now I get to go in the kitchen when I want to be creative, when I want to make new things, not because I have to. Yeah. Uh, not because I'm producing the same things we've been producing all month long. It's yeah, because yeah. I get to be creative. And, and now that's hardly ever. When she wants to dabble and have fun, she gets to do it, but nobody counts on her to do it. So here, I remember one of your clients. Now, I don't know this guy's name, but you framed his like work boots. That's Joe. That's Joe. Yeah. Tell me about Joe, because I thought that was a great story. So Joe and his wife, Christy, ran their business. They do uh, duct and chimney cleaning, air ducts and such. And it was just them. And it was mostly just Joe. Christy helped out with the bookkeeping in the office. But Joe was the technician. So he found the work. He sold the He was the man in the van. Story, man in the van. And that's when they came to me in coaching. They were referred to me because Christy's brother was also a client. And so we start, started working on some systems. And he wanted to grow the business. And when he started his business, his only goal was to replace his income from when he right. had a job. So he don't, hang on, let's, don't set that as a goal. Never <laughs> set a goal to just replace income. Your goal's got to be to build a business that works without yes. you. So through coaching, he started changing his mentality of what it was like to be a business owner. And right. I sent out this little graphic that I posted on social media, and it said, sweat builds you a business, excuse me, sweat builds you a job, systems build you a business. And it had a picture of work boots. And he comes to the coaching session the next week, and he goes, coach, I get it. I don't, I don't want a job anymore. And he goes, those boots, they look like my boots. And he holds his foot up above the table. He's like, those are, my boots look just like the boots in that picture. And I don't want to wear these boots anymore. And he set a goal right then and there that he wanted to retire his work boots. So he had to learn systemization of the business. Absolutely. Okay. And, and hire. And how to hire people yes. and how to keep them how and to how to manage them. them and lead them and train them and all those yeah. things. What's, what's two or three great lessons that he got and really applied well that everyone can learn from today? Uh, the hiring process was huge for him because he really, 
he was his own business. So it took a lot of, of faith and, and trust that you can train other technicians to represent your company in the way that you would represent it yourself. So he had to learn trust as yeah, well. To, yeah. I think that's a big one. When you're employing people, you've got to learn to trust other people. And people are like, well, what if I don't trust them? Then don't employ them. Mm -hmm. You know, find someone you trust and employ that person. Yeah. But your first ever employee is scary as heck, I believe, yeah. you know? Nowadays, it's like, you know, I know for us, we've had thousands of them over the years in all the different companies, and it's like, yeah, just hire someone. But you're right. What else did Joe have to pick up on to get that one? Well, then he had to figure out what his new role was. So we had to rewrite Joe's job description. He lost a bit of his identity because he's well, not yeah, a technician anymore. But when you go to a party, you don't walk into a party and say, hey, I'm Joe the CEO. You're used to saying... People go, what do you do? Well, I clean chimneys right. and ducts. Exactly. Huh. Yeah. So we had to rewrite his job description and what he wanted to be responsible for. And it took him a little while to be able to emotionally let go of what he was doing and get into a new default system. So hang on. He wanted to stay in the chimneys? No. <laughs> <laughs> he did it logically, but yet that was his comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so comfort yeah. zone is another big one there yeah. for the growth. Because I think that... And this is something you know very well because you do this with all of your clients. You've got to grow the human before you can grow the business. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we reframed his job description and how he defines success in his new role as a CEO. And his name's still also in the business development box. So he's right. been able to go out and get some big commercial contracts, which continues to be. So he's still team. sales guy, marketing guy, yeah. but he's now CEO doing yeah. those roles. But quality control as well. So yeah. is he looking to replace himself in the sales and marketing roles at some stage? Eventually. Yeah, that, that's one of his goals. Right now he's loving it. Okay. Because he's getting good results and he's still learning. Sales, did you have? Did he have to learn much on sales or was he a natural, great sales He person? was naturally pretty good at that. What he needed more was the structure because mm -hmm. uh, he, he's great at engaging with people, but he just needed the system and the structure to keep him on track and make sure it stayed productive. A lot of people don't realize you have to systematize a sales process. You yeah. have to step by step it. and Because soft systems, by soft system, gang, what I mean is the scripts, the words you use. Most people don't systematize the soft stuff. Right. They, they systematize, here's how you put paint on a wall, or here's how you make the hamburger stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and, and what about his wife, Christy? Did she have to grow as well in the position, or did she step aside and go, I'm out of here now? Or what's... There were some of both. When he, when he first said, I want to retire my boots, and she's like, oh, that's great, honey, that's good for you. <laughs> and I said, by when? And he said, by the end of the year. And she goes, honey, <laughs> I, that's a great goal for you, but we might need a couple of years. So she really had to grow. And he did it, by the way. By December 31st of that year, that's when I bought him the frame of the boots. Um, but So she had to grow to grow and expand her goals, which she thought was possible. Mm -hmm. Her position evolved, and then uh, throughout the process, some family dynamics, that she actually ended up taking a step back out of the business, and they, they replaced her in the business. Almost I love like seeing that, though. I love when you're able to retire one family member, and then the second one can retire later, but yeah. you can retire one family member and those sorts of things. I think that's really cool. So you, you've got a lot of clients who come to you looking for that, I want to eventually have the, my business work without me. Yes. Okay. Um, any other favorite clients that you've got that, that you great lessons from? Because I think there's so many important things you've been teaching so far. One uh, a client that I've had for about a year, they run a therapy group where they do in-home therapy, mostly pediatrics, speech, occupational, et cetera. And she, they had more business than they could handle. Right. But the fear was still, well, I don't want to grow too fast because it felt like she was getting the speed wobble, but it was purely mental. When they're turning away referrals from their providers and from the insurance companies because they didn't have enough therapists, but yet it was just still this um, emotional... Uh, aspect of being willing to grow to the extent that your business is trying to grow yeah. with or without you. <laughs> well, look, yeah, I know we get a lot of clients who come to us at Action Coach because they, they don't have enough business coming in and, and they need yeah. more business. So yeah. the sales and marketing aspects of it. So in this case, it was more a management, leadership and systemization side of the business yeah. where, hey, I got all the business I need. I just I can't control this yeah. thing. Yeah, and we, we needed to add other therapists. We started out by measuring how productive are your therapists, how full are their schedules, mm -hmm. are they efficiently routed and things like that, and there's still a lot of space. So let's look at, at recruiting. What are some of the biggest lessons on recruiting that you teach people? Because obviously Joe had to, I mean, all of your clients so far have had to recruit. Yeah. What, what are some of the biggest lessons on doing good recruiting? Hire for character, train for skill. Okay, explain um, that one to me. 
that in most, while some positions such as therapy actually do require particular education and designations, uh, you can't train character. Most of the skills and how we do things here and our way of doing things, our systems, that can all be taught. But you can't train a values fit. You can't train a company culture fit. You can't train somebody to care. Yeah, and that's I, I, a lot of times that's why I get business owners to write out their culture because you can't recruit in your culture if you don't actually know what your culture right. is and have it documented yeah. and stuff. Good. What else do we got to do to be a good recruiter? Be clear on what outcomes you want for the position. It's not just a list of tasks. I find that those are very vague. It's like, oh, basically you're responsible for everything in this domain, but it's not clear. Like, what are the indicators? How at the end of the day will you objectively measure if this person's succeeding? How will they know if they're getting an A? How will they know if they're winning? Yeah, and, and it's real interesting though, Carrie. A lot of small businesses don't measure their employees' performance. Right. They don't have key performance or key activity indicators in place. And so that, so you're saying before you even run the job ad, you should know how you're going to measure. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. What else? What else we got to do to be a good recruiter? They uh, need to interview really well, have a good recruitment process that, and be willing to deselect people when they don't meet the criteria. I like that word, the deselect word. We've used that at Action Coach for a long time. Explain to everyone what that means though. Um, for example, if you say that you value attention to detail and there's a typo in the resume, just stop reading it. But they emotionally say, but look at all this great experience they have. Well, they've just shown you who they are. Believe them. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's funny, you know. Cause I know I've done that. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's why I'm laughing at it. It's like, huh, thanks for that lesson, Carrie. I could have had that a few years And you years ask back. them when there's a mishire, which, which still happens from time to time, but you ask them, in hindsight, looking back, did you see the red flag? that ultimately led the employee to come on board and then fail. And 100% of the time they said, I saw it and I chose to Yeah, ignore I ignored it. it. Mm. Yeah, thanks for that reminder. Yeah, Appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Glad I could coach here today, Brad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, the interesting thing is I know in recruiting, and I, I had to actually get to a point where I would write out the questions before mm -hmm. I went into a recruitment, same as I do in a sales scenario, yeah. same as I do in a coaching scenario, because what I'd find is that if I didn't write out the questions I wanted to ask beforehand, I would just get in there and just start talking. Yeah, it's a you know, chit chat. And, and they end up listening. You end up talking. You know, and and that doesn't work. So, right. um, and I know for us, we use multiple different uh, interview. We do the group sessions, social interviews, mm -hmm. uh, panel. I love panel interviews. Do you guys use panel mm -hmm. interviews a lot? Yeah. I've always found that the greatest thing about panel interviews is that. You know, if I've got, say, five team members going to interview a new potential team member, I make each of them come with two questions. Therefore, they're all learning good questions from each other. And so as they get more senior in the company, they've got a good list of yeah. questions or a good set of skills for, for recruiting and, and hiring. So what else do we have to learn in order to get the, the, the business growing in this particular case? In the case of hiring employees? Yeah. I mean, well, you look at it, they've had to hire therapists. Obviously, they had to learn management and learn leadership more yeah. because as you add team, you got to get better at that yeah. stuff. I'd say another common mistake that business owners make is lack of an onboarding process, onboarding and training process. So induction, I mean, it was funny. I was teaching, oh, it's got to be a couple of months back, and I said, you know, so when you show people your uh, induction booklet, your introduction booklet, your company handbook, and they looked at me like... The what? <laughs> <laughs> I was like... Okay, you probably need to start with that one. Let's start there. Right. Write a company handbook of these are the rules of being in our company and yeah. that sort of thing. But it, it scares people to put that stuff down on paper because they've never done it before. Mm -hmm. um, I like the fact that within coaching, we can give them examples and lead them to, hey, read this, see that, do that sort of stuff. Do a lot of your clients read? They do now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I find that audiobooks became a great source for my clients yeah. over the years because uh, a lot of them are like, I don't have time for reading. Do you get in the car? Yes, good. There you audiobooks go. Audiobooks and podcasts. Yeah. Yep. Podcasts also, like what we're doing right here, I think it's very invaluable to... Uh, the thing is with audiobooks, that, I mean, I love them, but it annoys me. I'm, I'm glad now you can put it on one and a half times speed oh, and, yeah. and listen to it much man. faster. Yeah. <laughs> but podcasts, I find I get a lot more you know, nuggets faster than when, when I'm, I'm doing just reading or audio books and yeah. that sort of stuff. So, okay. Top few things you think every business owner should focus on. Like you get a lot of business owners you meet every week. What are the top few things they should focus on? Get themselves moving, get themselves growing. The starting at the basics with having a really clear goal and then reverse engineering that. 
Uh, we often um, underestimate how long stuff takes, uh-huh. but then we also underestimate how much we can accomplish in in a you know a longer amount of time. So we overestimate how much we can accomplish in a quarter, but we underestimate how much we can accomplish in a year. Yeah. So if you're really really clear on here's where I want to be for the year, let me back it up to what I need to do each quarter and just be really clear and concise on a week to week basis. Here's the actual steps. You'll get a lot more done. Less truly is more. Um, and involve the team, you know, empower the team and, and be okay with, with relinquishing some control and letting other people help you along that. I want, I want to touch on that one just a little more, the relinquishing of control. I've always found that for the majority of business owners that I've coached, they are the thing holding them back. It's Bottleneck's like, at the top. Bottleneck is at the top. Fish stinks from the head yes. down. You know, what? how do you get clients through that? Is there a particular couple of things? Is there a magic carry pill to get them through that letting go type thing? Clarity on the job descriptions, including the owners, what's their job and what's somebody else's job. Has that person been equipped and trained? And then you just have to suck it up yeah. and let go. And yeah. sometimes asking, well, what's the worst that could happen? You know what could happen? And the delegation process could be systemized better. You know, some of them just say, well, let me here show you what to do it. And now it's your job. Yeah. Versus saying, okay, like, hey, let me show you how to do it. And then you feed it back to me. Now let me watch you do it and give you feedback. And now I feel confident. I had one of my business partners just the other week. They abdicated a sales role across someone else. Said, "Tell me what training that person went through," and they're like, "Well, <laughs> yeah." It's like that's not delegation; that's abdication. Yeah. So fantastic, Carrie. Thank you so much for coming on the Business Coach TV show. Thanks, Thanks for bringing coming to Vegas and spending your time with us. Awesome. Thank you.